Funny, right? If you had the chance to watch Gilda on the Saturday Night Live show, you wouldn't have expected anything less, and you would have understood better why we still talk about her even after 35 years of her demise. This beacon of comedy used her talent to make her audience laugh and always made sure she wore her contagious smile. But behind her smile is a secret that was concealed for so many years. As we remember this amazing human, we will share with you all that you never knew about Gilda Radner's life and death. Gilda's Humble Beginnings On June 28, 1946, Gilda Radner was born in Detroit, Michigan. Her parents, Henrietta Dworkin and Herman Radner, are the perfect examples of the kind of parents most people wish to have. Although they were not the richest people in the world, Henrietta, a legal secretary, and Herman, a businessman, made sure they provided almost all that Gilder needed. Also, Gilder never lacked love, care, and attention. Now you know why Gilda smiled so much even as an adult. There was a strong connection with every part of the family, especially her nanny, Elizabeth Clementine Gillies. If you've ever wondered about the inspiration behind the character, Emily Latella, look no further. It was solely based on Elizabeth Clementine. Herman Radner wasn't a small businessman. He operated Detroit's Seville Hotel where many celebrities of the time stayed whenever they came to perform in the city. Gilda was a daddy's little girl, so she would follow her dad to work often, an act that exposed her to a world of fame early in life. Meeting with celebrities wasn't the only thing. She also followed her father on trips to see Broadway shows. What a beautiful life Gilda had as a child. But unfortunately, this life didn't last for long. When Gilda was just 12, her father developed a brain tumor. The sickness escalated very quickly from Herman complaining about his glasses too tight to him getting bedridden a few days later. No one in the family expected things to go south that fast. Soon, Herman was unable to speak and remained in a critical condition for two years. After two years of pain, Herman gave up the ghost, which was one of the worst moments in Gilder's life. But you see, Gilda had always been a strong woman, so she didn't let it bring her down. No matter what happens, life must go on. Gilda continued schooling, but she was still held back by her health issues that stressed her so much. She had eating disorders as a child, making her weigh as much as 160 pounds and as little as 93. This weight distressed Gilda's mother, so she took Gilda to see a doctor who gave her Dexedrine diet pills. But above this trouble, Gilda rose. She attended the Liggett School in Detroit, and in 1964, she enrolled at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, where she planned to get a degree in education. Gilad saw a future for herself in theater and chose the course, but never completed her degree. Gilda found love in a Canadian sculptor, Jeffrey Rubinoff, who chose him and followed him to Toronto. There, she used her talent and made her debut in Godspell with future stars Eugene Levy, Andrea Martin, Victor Garber, Martin Short, and Paul Schaffer. Afterward, she became a member of the renowned Toronto-based comedy troupe Second City, performing with Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. And from 1974 to 1975, she was a featured player on the National Lampoon Radio Hour, a comedy program syndicated to some 600 U.S. radio stations. And just like that, Gilda moved closer to the spotlight every step she took. The SNL Show it didn't matter if you were meeting Gilda for the first time or you'd met her severally, she was outstanding. She had a unique talent that was easily seen everywhere she went, but not many people had the opportunity to meet her and experience her art. But it didn't take long for her to shine so bright. In 1975, she gained recognition as one of the original Not Ready for Primetime Players the freshman cast of the first season of Saturday Night Live. It is not surprising that Gilda was the first performer to be cast in the show. What's more amazing is the fact that she co-wrote much of the material that she performed and collaborated with Alan Zweibel, who is one of the show's writing staff, on the development of sketches that featured her recurring characters. Just like a flash, between 1975 to 1980, Gilder created many characters, the ones we can never forget, such as the obnoxious personal advice expert Roseanne Rosanna Donna, who was modeled after a New York reporter, Roseanne Scamardella, and course, Baba Wawa, a parody of Barbara Walters. Yeah, we all loved that one except one person who didn't find it so funny at first, Barbara Walters herself. Not that she hated it, but she just didn't find it funny the way we did. Well, what do you expect? But her perspective soon changed on the day she walked in on her daughter watching Baba Wawa. Seeing how much her daughter was enjoying the show, she sat down to watch with her, and for the first time she enjoyed the show and smiled while watching Gilda. 
Walter made history as the first female co-host of a U.S. news program, NBC's Today Show, before Gilda brought out the impression, which poked fun at Walter's mild speech impediment. Even though she didn't appreciate Baba Wawa at first, she couldn't resist Gilda's charm for so long. Let's also talk about another invented character of Gilda Emily Latella, an elderly, hearing-impaired editorialist who made irate, misinformed comments and interview sketches on SNL's recurring Weekend Update segment. Remember Emily Latella was based on Elizabeth Gillies, Gilder's nanny? But that is not all. She also parodied celebrities such as Lucille Ball, Patti Smith, and Olga Korbut in SNL sketches. To many of us, it was years of being on our screens and entertaining us, but to Gilda, it was just years of hard work that would eventually pay off after three years of consistency. In 1978, she won an Emmy Award for her work on SNL. Even after her death, Gilda was ranked ninth in the importance of all 141 SNL cast members from start to 2015 by Rolling Stone. You would agree that Gilda deserved it. If not for anything, for her impression of broadcast journalist Barbara Walters, who was renamed Baba Wawa, which turned out to be a bigger hit. Since then, all Gilda did was smash it really big. At a time in 1979, the new president and CEO of NBC, Fred Silverman, offered Gilda her own primetime variety show, but she turned down the offer. That same year, she was a host of the Music for UNICEF concert at the United Nations General Assembly. Are you woman? Are you man? I'm your biggest. Gilder also gave the commencement address, in character as Roseanne Rosanna Donna, to the 1917 graduating class at the Columbia School of Journalism. Undoubtedly, she was really loved at this time that fans rushed to show her love severally. Although Gilda was not really cool about that, she got more upset when fans didn't approach her for autographs. Yeah. Gilda was a dramatic human, but we can't also deny the fact that she gave life to each character she invented and that she cracked every one of her audience's ribs each time. As she made us smile a lot, she also made sure to smile a lot amidst her health issues. It was more like Gilda didn't really have enough time to enjoy her life with sickness. First, it was her eating disorder, bulimia, that had troubled her from the age of nine. And this disorder continued up until Gilda Radner was a cast member. In the documentary titled Love, Gilda delved more into this difficult time in her life. Lisa DiPolito, the filmmaker, wrote a piece for TalkHouse.com and said that Gilda wrote a journal entry about going to the hospital in 1978 because she was doing poorly. She wrote, My picture's in the paper, but my body's in the garbage. As several sources have explained, Gilda was teased when she was growing up because of her weight, and diet pills became part of her routine when she was only 10. It's awful to imagine how she must have felt, and it seems that when she became part of Saturday Night Live, her struggles continued. She explained in It's Always Something, the memoir that she wrote, It's Always Something, I coped with stress by having every possible eating disorder from the time I was nine years old. I wasn't interested in drugs because I had food. If you think about it, it is a whole lot for just a person to handle on their own. But how exactly did Gilda choose to handle her problem? She chose to see humor in her problems. According to Gilda, there's humor in everything. We just have to look to find it. She embodied the mindset that we have to deal with whatever we're going through one way or the other. And in her case, she chose humor over gloom. And when she thought she had finally cracked the code to beat life at its game, she was hit by the saddest news of her life. While everyone knew about her diagnosis of ovarian cancer, not many knew the story about her death, a secret that was finally revealed by her husband, Gene Wilder. She Anything. was always a sucker for a big a, laugh. A sucker for a laugh. I, I'm the best audience. The beginning of the end. According to Gene, it all started on the first Sunday in January 1986. Gilda and Jean drove to a friend's house in Los Angeles to play tennis. Suddenly, Gilda began to feel what she described as a fog rolling in. She could not keep her eyes open and she felt like she was going to fall asleep. But as soon as they got to the tennis court, she stood up and started playing. It was as if magic had happened. Everything disturbing her disappeared like they never came. For that, both Jean and Gilda thought it was nothing serious, but still, Gilda went to an internist in Los Angeles to check it out. He did a full blood workup and came back and said she had Epstein-Barr virus and chronic fatigue. He then told her to go home and relax. Gilda did as she was told, but over the next months, the symptoms kept coming. They'd come for 10 days and go away. The sudden fatigue, the feeling of fog would hit, and then she'd take a nap in the afternoon and wake up feeling fine. After they left LA for their home in Connecticut, the symptoms got worse. She was so bloated she started to have trouble buttoning the top of her slacks. 
It was weird because Gilda was only bloated. She wasn't gaining any weight. In June, they went to Paris, where Jean took her to his favorite bistro. After they ate, she started feeling uncomfortable, and the discomfort grew as they went outside walking on the street. She complained of having cramps, pains in her tummy, and terrible bloating. By July, when they got back home, she had started to develop what she called nervous legs. She couldn't keep them still. She had shooting pains down her thighs, all the time she was moving them, even in bed at night. She would move them all night till she fell asleep. At the time, they never stopped seeing different doctors. A gynecologist in California did a pelvic examination and said everything was fine. One of the doctors thought the symptoms just had to do with her ovulating. I'm constipated, my feet swelled, my gums are bleeding, my sinuses are clogged, I got heartburn, I'm cranky and I have gas. In New York, her gynecologist said she thought it was a stomach problem. They also went to a gastroenterologist who did some blood work, a sonogram, and a pelvic examination. He said it wasn't anything life-threatening and that Gilda was only a very nervous and emotional person. At this time, Gilda feared she had cancer, and so she kept asking the doctors for confirmation. But the doctors, every one of them for 10 months, took note of the fact that Gilda was a high-strung person and kept telling her, no, don't worry, go home and relax. Then Gilda started to bloat so much that her belly stuck out like a balloon. They went back to California, and she went to see the internist again. He sent her for another gynecological exam. They found nothing. Then he did more blood work. And finally, three weeks later, he called the couple for the result. He said to them, something's irregular about your liver function. At that moment, Gilda had started to panic. On October 24, the gynecologist put her in the hospital. That night, 10 months after Gilda was first examined, the doctor told them that they had discovered a malignancy. When she first heard the words ovarian cancer, Gilda cried, but then she turned to her husband to say, thank God, finally someone believes me. That night, Jean was told that Gilda didn't have much chance, but he was too scared to tell his wife. 36 hours later, they operated on her and found a grapefruit-sized tumor. It was advanced ovarian cancer, stage four. But after the surgery, the doctor assured Gilda that she was clean. But the session was followed by the world of chemotherapy once every three weeks for months. That must be one of the scariest things to happen to anyone. But Gilda still wanted to find humor in it. She asked that they make a video of her so she would play after she got better. She would say, look at me, as she bounced around like she was the lightweight champion of the world. Eventually, when her hair fell out, she was devastated, but she made jokes about that too. She even made everyone around her feel better about her situation. Her husband, for example, didn't have any issue when her hair fell off. He thought it was beautiful. Gilda was going through hell, but for a while, doctors thought the treatments were working. One internist even told them that they were lucky as the treatment could be a final cure. Should I do it? I don't know. Um, but I'm all dressed up and I have makeup on, my hair yeah. is all nice and I'm gonna do it. Giving them hope. But there was an issue. The doctors, Gilda and her husband, none of them knew about advanced ovarian cancer. It means Gilda didn't have to die if not for the ignorance about her condition. Gilda might have been caught at a less advanced stage if two things had been done. If she had been given a CA-125 blood test as soon as she described her symptoms to the doctors instead of 10 months later, and if the doctors had known the significance of asking her about her family's history of ovarian cancer, but they didn't. So Gilda went through the tortures courtesy of ignorance. Let's not fail to acknowledge that the doctors who worked with Gilda were mostly wonderful people. But here's the thing. None of them put it all together and asked about her family history. According to Jean Wilder, Gilda's grandmother, her cousin, and her aunt had ovarian cancer, but she didn't know it. If only they had taken a thorough family history, she would have found out. So many of the doctors wrote off what Gilda was telling them by saying she was a high-strung, emotional, and nervous girl. Gilda's final days. Gilda didn't hide the news of her diagnosis, but she was not the only one sad about it. Gilda's audience was devastated learning about what was going on with their beloved. Through her empathetic performances and manner, Gilda built up social capital. Her experience turned society's attention to the issue of misdiagnosis for female patients and the dismissal of women by healthcare professionals. Gilda used her power as a public figure to continue to make appearances and build publicity, including her book tour, throughout the end of her life. Gilda shared her struggles publicly through talks and writing. While she was dying, she wrote a book about her life and battles with the disease, which she still describes as seriously funny. Gilda begins her book by saying, Cancer is probably the most unfunny thing in the world, but I'm a comedian. 
and even cancer couldn't stop me from seeing the humor in what I went through. Her introduction gives the audience the audacity to defy social norms and laugh about a tragic topic. Her approach made us realize that life comes in black or white, funny or sad, and that we have the power to decide how to deal with it. Gilda was completely honest about what she was facing, which served as an inspiration and solace for many others going through the same challenges. After she was told about stage four ovarian cancer, the battle became extremely challenging for her, a challenge that extended beyond her career. But we must commend her courage as she carried on with her trademark humor refusing to let go of herself. Gilda did a good job holding on to herself in her final days. Although she was scared, she faced her problems with resilience and humor. Her attitude towards her diagnosis serves as a reminder that we can actually make smiles out of the limes life throws at us. She embraced her role as a beacon of hope and became an ardent advocate for cancer awareness. Using her influential platform, Gilda dedicated herself and her time to teaching others about the nature of cancer. The courage she showed while facing death showed that wherever Gilda was and whatever happened to her, she would continue to make an impact. We can't even deny that heaven currently enjoys her impact if there's anything like that. But unfortunately, after fighting cancer head-on with humor, she passed away on May 20, 1989 at age 42. The Legacy while Gene Wilder was mourning her wife, he said he continuously heard Gilda's voice to do something and not just sit down there crying. He then picked it up from where Gilda stopped. He played an instrumental role in establishing the Gilda Radner Hereditary Cancer Program at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center and the Gilda Radner Ovarian Detection Center both aimed at early detection and research. These initiatives are part of Gilda's enduring legacy, extending her impact beyond the realm of comedy and into the critical field of cancer awareness and support. He revealed to the world that if Gilda had been diagnosed earlier, she would have lived longer as she would be saved. Sadly, the information known today could not save Gilda, but it has helped save many lives. After the attention that Gilda's story garnered, 450 families with ovarian cancer were registered at the Familial Ovarian Cancer Registry. I know that in the last few months of her life, Gilda's cancer became resistant to the chemotherapy she was receiving. A research database registry at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center in Buffalo, New York. The registry was renamed the Gilda Radner Familial Ovarian Cancer Registry in 1990 and renamed the Familial Ovarian Cancer Registry in 2013. In 1996, Gene and registry founder Stephen Piver, one of Gilda's medical consultants, published a book titled Gilda's Disease, sharing personal experiences and a medical perspective on ovarian cancer. In 1991, Joanna Bull, Gilda's cancer psychotherapist, and broadcaster Joel Siegel, together with Gene Wilder, also founded Gilda's Club, a network of affiliated clubhouses where people living with cancer, their friends, and families. Joanna Bull is reportedly a cancer survivor, while Joel Siegel also died of cancer. Around that time, different people founded different clubs in Gilda's name across the United States and Canada. In July 2009, Gilda's Club Worldwide merged with the Wellness Community, another established cancer support organization, to become the Cancer Support Community. As of 2012, more than 20 local affiliates of Gilda's Club were active. Although some local affiliates of Gilda's Club and the Wellness Community have retained their names, many affiliates have adopted the name Cancer Support Community following the merger. The world really cannot forget Gilda. Back in 2002, ABC dedicated a three-hour block of programming to Gilda. The evening kicked off with a one-hour display of Gilda Radner's greatest moments. This show was hosted by Saturday Night Live alumnus Molly Shannon, and it featured highlights from her career and appearances by friends and co-stars Victor Garber, Kermit the Frog, Eugene Levy, Steve Martin, Paul Schaffer, Lily Tomlin, and Barbara Walters. After that, a television movie about her life titled Gilda Radner, It's Always Something, was shown. If ghosts really do see what goes on in the world they left behind, Gilda would be so happy and proud of her achievements. Talking about achievements, she didn't fail to receive some awards. Gilda won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Continuing or Single Performance by a Supporting Actress in Variety or Music for her performance on Saturday Night Live in 1977. 
She posthumously won a Grammy Award for Best Spoken Word or Non-Musical Recording in 1990. In 1992, Gilda was inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame for her achievements in arts and entertainment. Through the generosity of many who participated in the 2002 ABC special Gilda Radner's Greatest Moments, including Linda Carter, Victor Garber, Eric Idle, David Letterman, Eugene Levy, Peter Mann, Steve Martin, Mike Myers, Paul Schaffer, Lily Tomlin and the Jim Henson Company, producer-actor James Tominia, spearheaded a campaign to dedicate a posthumous star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame to Gilda. That, and more, she deserves. And on June 27, 2003, Gilda received her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame at 6801 Hollywood BLD. Saturday Night Live alumna, Molly Shannon and the host of the ABC special served as master of ceremonies at the induction ceremony at which Lorraine Newman, Gilda's club founder Joanna Bull, and Gilda's brother Michael F. Radner appeared to present the honor. Also, parts of West Houston Street in New York City, Lombard Street in Toronto, and Chester Avenue in White Plains, New York, have been renamed Gilda Radner Way. The private road off Kirk Road in Warminster Township, Pennsylvania, leading to the cancer support community Greater Philadelphia, formerly Gilda's Club Delaware Valley, is also named the same. More than a job. Being the show that catapulted Gilda to the spotlight, she had some things to say about her appearance and time on the show. From the interviews that Gilda Radner gave, it seems that she loved being a cast member on Saturday Night Live because she enjoyed the creative process. In one interview now available on YouTube, Gilda Radner shared how she created her amazing Saturday Night Live characters. She said, I didn't come to Saturday Night Live with any characters. I believe that they came out of the entire situation, the show, the demands of writers, and the demands within a scene, the demand of just getting yourself on the air. She also mentioned that her famous character is Emily Latella, who she invented in honor of her caregiver, who looked after her from when she was four years old until 18. She also mentioned that she used that specific voice because that is how her nanny talked. She also mentioned that she loved her time on SNL because a comic view of the world saved her. Gilda loved to be funny at all times. She added, I was a funny kid. It was my way of choosing to deal with the world. It's more of a lifestyle for me than a job. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.